day, oh, what is this? Yeah, wow, we've been in uh, physical distancing here for, well, ourselves for over a month since early March, but we started our broadcasts uh, 20 days ago. This is the 20th day. And broadcasting both to my personal Facebook page live as well as the Wolf Camp and the Wolf College Facebook page live. Um, and then we're going to post it up to YouTube. And I want to show you, and I did this in reverse so that you can see it. <laughs> I printed it. Okay, Kim can um, hold that up to the camera. There you go. Um, these are the principles of permaculture as defined by uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Uh, you might notice uh, kind of goes the way that this person put it together, which is permaculture.co.uk. You can see the uh, link down at the bottom. It's a really nice one, although it's more colorful. Our printer ran out of magenta. Um, and um, it's instead of a list of one through ten principles, it is a nice circle because, of course, they go around and around and around. The first thing is to observe and interact with your property. Like I said the other day, don't do anything um, probably at all for a year until you observe how water flows and things like that. Another thing, another piece of vocabulary we're going to have today is what Bill and um, Holmgren and, and Mollison described as sectors, but they're really vectors, I think is what they meant, or maybe in Australia it's opposite, but anyways, vectors are energies that come in at your property, the sun, the rain, the water, how it flows, um, other people coming onto your property, if you have a workstation on your property, any pollutants that are put into it, the cars that come in putting pollutants and impacting the soil, things like that are all what they say sectors, I call vectors. Um, and then there are also zones, and so we're going to walk through the different zones in our permaculture design, and uh, definitely get a look at just look up permaculture principles and read through those. Those are, and I'm going to show you the difference between common practice in modern okay. society, and oh yeah, right, and um, <laughs> and what that. we consider incredibly high principles by something that just happened today is pretty exciting. Um, and uh, so I want to show you, first of all, our design. The first one that we did was just fine to do it. Um, no. Doesn't matter, it's backwards. Um, on a manila envelope, that was our original design of the housing property and where we wanted to put the orchard out <laughs> here and everything. Um, and then the uh, a bit of a bigger one, um, when we were going through the permaculture design course, was that. But I'm going to show you kind of a color-coded one that shows the different um, zones. So permaculture is zones. This is zone one is basically your house. And so you can see our house is right here in the middle. And uh, I didn't color code that. Zone one is basically where you live or the areas that you are always, you know, interact with more than several times a day, really. And so our patio where we always walk in and out of the house over there is really zone one. The yellow here that we've got is zone two. We're st the porch itself right here maybe is um, zone one, but mm. the rest of it, we very rarely come out here on the front porch, and so uh, we use a different entrance. And so really it's zone two in this area, this whole yellow area, and that's areas where we have our close-in culinary herb garden, for instance, where we wanna, we're cooking, we're like, oh, need some basil, run out to the uh, garden just outside of the door that we know, always go out near the kitchen. That's um, maybe even considered zone one. I see you put the chicken coop in there too. Well, Good. Kim goes out Smart. to the chicken several times a day, <laughs> and so that's definitely, well, zone two, yeah. technically. Um, our herb garden is really in the white area, zone one. Um, and we also have our tomato, our, the, the food that we're growing in pots and stuff, the hot stuff, basil, all the pizza fixings, tomatoes, that's really on the patio there. Zone two, chickens where Kim goes every day, where Lily, our dog, runs around a lot. Um, and just the very front porch, because we come out here uh, once a couple weeks, once a week or two. Or more now. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, and then in the orange is zone three. Those areas um, are areas that we interact with maybe once a day, for instance, driving in and out once a day or uh, you know going out to the garage to get uh, you know do something once a day usually those areas are occasionally visited zone three so you might have um, large fruit trees that are right in your yard you might have some livestock that are just foraging right around your yard however zone four that we have in the pink um, and pink is more minimal care you don't even 
barely mow it, probably don't mow it, mow, mow it. That's where you have a food forest, which we're gonna show you our food forest design. We have, you have livestock that are out there and you only take in and out once a day or something. Um, and zone five is completely unmaintained area. And for us, it's our neighbors, obviously we're not maintaining that area that and is. also the um, wetlands out there where it's all wild forest um, and that's in the green now the green I, I did kind of a green and a pink because in some seasons we're out there like one season we're out there all the time uh, every day with the strawberries and stuff but the rest of the season year it's wetlands really so we leave it alone all right so that's kind of an introduction to permaculture and now let's do permaculture what do you say? All right, and then we're gonna come back and try to finish up here. And um, I'm gonna bring this along. Here, do you want me to stick it in here? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay, I'll put it on the back of mine. All right, I need my gloves because we're gonna do some work here. And I gotta take a drink of my stinging nettle tea because uh, the, net the allergies just started in today. What do you think it is that's causing them for you? I don't know, there's only one sneeze or two. Mm. But I'm gonna really slam the stinging nettle tea to try to stave off having to take Claritin okay as long as possible this year Great. last year i did it and i don't think i took any claritin until june when the reed canary grass was just oh, blasting because really that is the absolute worst for me oh care? do you want to take that one no no you it's oh, better okay you sure it. all right so we're going to um walk over here and i got to show you this cool thing that happened so for those of us who have um principles of permaculture ingrained in our um system of values and ethics now our neighbor was said to me out on the uh, sidewalk today, oh, you know what, uh, I have all these leaves that went to the uh, dump, but they're only open on Fridays and Saturdays and they're not even take yard waste anyway because of all the physical distancing rules and stuff. And I was like, what kind of leaves are you talking about? Because from a permaculture perspective, that's like free money on your property, um, some energy that you can put in. And so he was like, oh, it's kind of a mix of, um, you know, uh, maple leaves, and uh, there's a few of his long needled um, pine in there. I was like, oh, yeah, we can't really use that in the garden to be too acidic. But wait a minute, perfect for around our strawberries. I mean, excuse me, yeah, well, strawberries wouldn't be bad too, but for all around all our blueberries, which of course, Blue Sky Farm is kind of named after the old blueberries that are here. And so this is just amazing stuff to put around our blueberries because they like it acidic. Um, so this is like, this is like money to us. And uh, so we were super excited. Of course, he looked at me a little strangely, but you know, uh, that's how it is. We don't <laughs> live traditionally necessarily is that some people look at you a little funny. But, but, that's all right. That's why you join really funny, weird uh, Facebook groups uh, to keep everybody from telling you you're nuts. <laughs> now you got to be careful about unproven hypotheses, but and you got to find out whether these principles work for you because uh, they aren't necessary. Now we're going to go out and ins do another thing before we come back and use these and put around the uh, blueberries. We're going to. Uh, go out and install our community sidewalk garden. We're we, start. Yes. We're starting. Yes. Now that's out in zone, normally would be zone four to five, but this year in our, uh, you know, this whole physical distancing time period, we're going to turn it into kind of a community sidewalk garden. And then probably we'll, because it's hard to maintain out there, really hard as you'll see, hard to weed, we're going to uh, end up having to Hope, well, we're going to put in some wildflowers now to see if they'll take over and compete. Otherwise, we're going to have to mow and put in some fruit trees that we'd, you know, like plum. Yeah, maybe plums. I don't know. We'd, we really need more pears, but we can't put those pears. out there because people oh. will just take the pears and the pears only cool. produce a few per. I know. Well, there was a dog out here, too. There's a dog, but there's also raccoons, so. Yeah. Anyway, so this is the front right here, and we're going to invite all the neighbors in this area to grab the, the potatoes right behind there. Oh. Um, and you can see that we've started these rows. Yeah. Sure. We've started these rows, um, and we're going to go all the way down with three rows. The first front area, which gets 
you know, we don't want to eat food out of that. That is going to get some pollution off the sidewalk with dogs, things like that. So we're going to have a mound and put wildflowers in. So, um, and I'm going to show you how I did this. Now, I scraped off the top layer of sod. And then there's still roots down below, which is going to be a, a problem. Up in this area, it's the worst. The further you go down, it's way better. Um, and so the only th we're roots that we're really worried about are grasses that will be hard to weed, and that's reed canary grass. So anytime I come across a root such as this, that's a reed canary oh, grass rhizome root, that has to go out like on the sidewalk or somewhere to die. Next to the sidewalk. Yes. <laughs> uh, invasive grass that is impossible to get a, rid of unless you shade it out. Um, are very, very constant every day in your weeding, which obviously is not a zone four or five situation. Anyway, so we're going to um, chunk this up and put in some, oh, found a reed canary grass root. Uh -oh. Get that out of there. Now these other roots that are in here are pretty, uh, which we don't mind. They are some uh, native blackberries. Uh, which would be fine. Wonderful native, uh, obviously it would be a great wildflower while it's flowering and then fruiting, which is another great thing to share with the community if we get some native uh, ones. So Kimmer has prepared, can you explain how you did this with sure. the wildflower seeds and then we're going to go to potatoes. Out. Sure. So I've been lobbying hard to have wildflowers put in the front because I think that it would be so uplifting and so beautiful and I love to support the pollinators because to me they are integral to all of the systems that we have going on. So um, in order to do that, I just took all of the wildflower seeds that I had. Now these are native flowers um, and some seeds from plants that I grow like calendula and lavender and um, uh, just a bunch of different mixes that are all local and I put them in a bucket, a little bucket, and then I added a bunch of sand in here because it's really hard to, to just broadcast the um, wildflower seeds because they're all different sizes and shapes and everything. So I did mix it with the sand so that we can broadcast it much more easily. Now, um, if you're using really small seeds, you can put them into something like this when it's left over or... Um, something like this and then just go along and sprinkle them but because I added things like calendula and I have some smaller sunflower seeds in there um, I decided to just opt for the bucket because they wouldn't fit out through the holes so that's what I did so let's give it a good stir I am so excited to watch these grow and hopefully we don't have to take them all out and mow them all down while well, we may because of that darned reed canary grass so anyway you ready for me go for it well, this is actually, this bucket is going to do the, the entire, entire row. row. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, it's probably going to be really super dense because I loaded it with seeds. Uh, Alright, while Kim is putting a few seeds on there and working them into the soil, do you want the uh, raker you're just going to use your hands? Now, you can see there's quite a bit of grass roots still in here. And I want to show you... I'm going to turn this over so you all can see what I'm doing over this direction. Okay. Yeah. Alright, well anyways, now there's quite a bit of grass right in this area. And so you have to get that layer of sod and roots out of there. Right, um, so I went on down low and I got underneath to create a layer of not very many roots in here. Now there's some okay roots in there. Any reed canary grass, I'll go through and pick that out. But any other roots that I don't mind is okay. And then I'm gonna, of course, we're thinking, I don't know what we're gonna do in here, in this section. Because it's so close to the sidewalk, we're not thinking about maybe not root crop down in there. The next row over, that's further away from the pollution type uh, vector or sector, uh, we'll put potatoes in because they're a pretty low maintenance um, crop that will grow almost in almost any soil and help turn and uh, you know move the soil around. So we're going to show you how to do that out of your old potatoes that are um, sprouting. But you only want to do it out of organic potatoes. We'll talk about that in a bit. But that's not even as good as if you have the money to buy seed potatoes. And we'll tell you why in a minute. So what you want to do is you have, if you have sod layer, 
which I did take off the layer, but there's still a lot of this reed canary grass root bits that you can just take. And I'm going to um, get underneath this layer of roots. By the way, it's better to go backwards when you're shoveling a ditch or a row because there's not as much resistance against you. That's not bad right there. Okay, so it looks like this area, this is a bunch of grass over here, but uh, we want this row to be right here. And so we want potatoes to go in here. Now, potatoes, this uh, is not gonna be too wet. And potatoes will, you can actually put them right in this, right here, and they'll start growing. But you also might wanna have dirt available to put on top of this. And so what I'm gonna do is start by breaking up this soil. Now, if you have a tiller, okay. But if you don't, you can just break it up like this. Or even with, I forgot to bring out the big pitchfork that was meant to bring that with when we were uh, putting all those mulchy leaves into there. So I spend more time breaking this up and pulling out any uh, roots that I don't want. And then, because I dug out the sod here, now anything below that is pretty good. But this, you can do this right in your lawn. Just take out the sod and see what the soil is like below it. And uh, so this can be plenty high to put potatoes in. And those potatoes will compete really easily with a lot of, uh, you know, grasses and other weeds. And they are pretty easily easy to distinguish when they come up, so you know what to weed and what not to. Oh yeah, deeper down, this is really good soil. Maybe I gotta go back. Oops, just found a reed canary grass root. Here's another one and another one. Yeah, this is the first section would be hard to weed, but at least it's closer to where we have our farm stand right there. Basically, y'all are watching from the point where we have our farm stand. We got the rules changed in our city, Puyallup, to allow farm stands that are not grandfathered in. And before that, it was illegal for anybody to sell food that they grew on their property at the farmer's market or anywhere, and now it's legal. So try to get your city also, and or county sometimes, to allow for anybody to you know grow food in their pots uh, in their house and you know sell it to neighbors or at the farmers market wherever all right so this is actually good enough to uh plant potatoes in right there huh. i'm gonna just break it up any real bad roots i'm gonna pull out and then Kimber, can you grab the potatoes sure and can you talk about, uh, you know, what's the best thing, sea potatoes, if you have the money and why? Yeah, so, um, and what else, what not to use? In an ideal world, you want to use a seed potato, which is a potato that's been grown. Um, somebody else could probably describe this better than me, I suppose. But it's, my understanding is it's a potato that's grown in an environment where it's not contaminated with anything, any sorts of potato diseases or blight or anything like that. And so um, because you get a just a really clean potato um, and you put it out you're not going to be adding any of those diseases into your yard or your property now if you decide that you want to get a store-bought potato and if it sprouts actually this probably happened to everybody you totally forgot about it in the bag in your cupboard or on your counter and open it up and it's all sprouty all over the place you can actually start those um, but they don't tend to grow quite as well and they're not as reliable as a seed potato would be now um, my understanding is that potatoes that are not organic have been treated with something that can impact the sprouts and make them so that they may sprout a little bit and then 
die. And so they're not necessarily going to produce anything for you. And besides, it's not an organically produced potato. And so it's been treated with pesticides. And so that's something that I don't want to put in my yard at all. So if you need to use a store-bought potato, um, which is actually what we need to do because I was late in ordering my seed potatoes, unfortunately. So this year we're just going to do some organic. And they're too expensive really, for a lot of people that order seed potatoes. Well, they can be, but they're more reliable. So, I mean, you have to weigh um, what you're doing and what you need. So anyway, what we're doing is we are using these organic potatoes that have started sprouting. So I've got an organic russet, I've got a red, and I've got a yellow. So one more reason that you might want to buy seed potatoes is if you like fancy potatoes, like the blue ones, or there's even some stripy ones, all sorts of different kinds. If you want a fancy potato, you're not usually going to find those at the local grocery store. So that's when it would be a really great thing to be able to order a seed potato of some really unique varieties. But once again, in our case, this is what we've got. Now, when you're going to be planting it, the key thing that you want to remember is sprouts face toward the sun because that's the direction that they want to grow. So just know when you tuck it down in the ground, sprouts up. Yeah, now we're using these not, not seed potatoes, but regular organic potatoes from the store that sprouted. And so we're not going to plant, we're not planning to plant potatoes here more than one year. Right. And so, that, or you can just put it in pots or a big, huge container. You can do a barrel or barrel. a big garbage can or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and then you can change out the uh, soil right. if it does get the blight. Where don't put this in your normal garden. Mm -hmm. If you expect, don't use seed potatoes if you're going to use a normal garden where you want to do potatoes every year because you wouldn't want to get blight in your soil. You can't get out later. So anyways, all you need to do is, uh, well, that's a huge sprout. I'm yeah. going to take this whole thing and cut it in half. Well, and I'm fine doing it okay. like this. It's kind of that method. Do you want me to put it in the bucket? To take that on. Okay. And um, there's quite a bit. You can do two or three. There's a nice little sprout right here. So we can put that one in. Yay. We can. I'm going to get them closer. Here's another one over here. There's basically it's our own homemade seed potatoes. <laughs> By for not one year. eating them soon enough. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. And then this whole thing I'm going to put in. Yeah. All at once. It's all yeah. together. So. so the way you plant it is just... Do you want me to move these closer? Oh, yeah. Sure. Because right now you're not even in the okay. frame. You know? mm -hmm. Pretty easy. Now we're going to uh, label and block this area off so that when um, any neighbors that want to participate in this, um, they can. And we're, we want to do them in our straight row so we know where they were, easy to weed. We can just take a hoe and go right up next to them, get the weeds out as they're popping up. Because we're not going to spend a ton of time out here weeding unless we get, get a lot of neighbors to yeah. help out. Um, and the other nice thing about this too is as your potato grows, you're going to want to add more soil to it, build up the mound around it. And so um, what's great is that we can just take more mound or more soil out of the furrow because as the weather improves, our water table drops down quite a bit. And so we're going to have um, a lot of soil to work with here, which will be great. So we're going to have these massive crazy mounds in front of our house. It's going to be so great. You want to just put that, put a little rock or something? That's all I've got for now. Okay. Yeah, we'll come back later. Yeah, we can come back later. There. One right there. Great. One right there. It's nice to get So we'll mark started. them with maybe little uh, yeah, popsicle sticks or something. You want to talk about what we're going to do in the middle? Yeah. We don't know what we're going to do in the middle yet. Oh, I guess maybe I we'll leave that up to the neighbors. Vision. Oh, what do you, what's your vision? Oh, I want to do lettuce and carrots. Okay. And then on the ends, I want to do squashes and cucumbers. All right, so, so we got to go to our next me. permaculture project. All right, I'm going to leave uh, up here we'll get it later. And the next project we're going to do is, is bring those, that mulch over to the blueberries, and then we're going to go into the back. And if you're having a hard time finding soil, or you don't want to buy soil, again, besides my suggestion of getting underneath your sod and finding soil there, if you have a problem with moles, <laughs> it's a really easy, great way to get... Um, are you going to leave all that there? Yeah, we'll fine. be back. We'll be back. Oh, yeah, finish what we started at least a little bit today. If you have problems with moles, just use that soil that they turn up. They turn up perfect, no weed soil from underneath your sod. 
it's amazing and wonderful. So camera, I'm gonna, uh, do you wanna pull the card or do you wanna grab the cameras? Um, whatever you say. Well, yeah, grab the card, it's pretty, I think it's pretty light. <laughs> we'll yeah. Camera was uh, weed whacking today and uh, it was a bit hard on her um, wrists. <laughs> so we're heading over to our blueberries that we showed you yesterday and mulch is so important. Now you have to be really careful not to over mulch, uh, especially in wet and wintry time. Uh, well, wet areas in the winter around here because you can actually make it, you know, make those roots of whatever you're trying to mulch, make them uh, waterlogged and you wanna do that. So you can see earlier, because he had a lot, we already did those blueberries back there but um, and a couple over that direction but right now I'm going to show you how to you now he took all his sticks I noticed yeah, I had a bunch of sticks over there but he took them he thought maybe I didn't want them or something I guess um, but I did kind of want the sticks because you can either if you have one of those um, mulchers or a blower that goes backwards to mulch you can blow you know mulch them even further down I think that's kind of a waste of time I mix them with sticks um, in order to, uh, I mix them with sticks in order to kind of keep loft and air going in there so that they don't just mold and stuff. So I'm going to dump these under here. your Starbucks usually so brewed yeah. and we get these free uh, burlap sacks although this is actually sisal or Cecil and we don't want to put these on the garden so much because the sisal or Cecil bur so-called burlap sacks are full of you know the light goes right through there but this is perfect to cover up uh, and kind of create another layer of mulch I'm gonna pull this away from the center because you don't want your mulch right up against whatever it is you're trying to mulch. And again, we are using this particular mulch because it's got some uh, pine needles in it and blueberries love it acidic. And pine is super acidic. This is extra layers just kind of hold these in. And as the summer gets drier and hotter, it helps it stay a bit moist in there. Now we wouldn't want those on the winter again because it would make it too wet. All right, let's keep on going. Now we're still in zone um, four out here because we don't monitor these particular, all our orchards. Now this is another way to put potatoes. And so we're out here in the back garden. I haven't started weeding it. I kind of neglected it last winter. All the cardboard blew off. Um, and so it's really weedy, unfortunately. And so I'm gonna to have to, again, spend a whole day in there weeding before we can get this going. It's too wet and to plant until mid-May. Anyway, so it's kind of lower priority right now. Um, right here is a feed trough. Um, and we can, we're gonna do potatoes in there this year because we want as much food as possible. It's gonna be somewhere where we have water into the back garden anyway. And so um, if you're wondering, hey, how do you get soil? Well, check this out. These moles right here, have been doing a number on our ground. And so I'm gonna just start throwing this soil right into the trough. Now you have to have something with a, with a water spigot, or excuse me, a water, you know, like drain, hole. drain hole. Yeah. And so I'm gonna, oh, can you grab the um, flat shovel that's over by your little mini garden? Yeah. And um, so I just wanna review on the principles of permaculture. This is our camp. Uh, RV back here for when we run summer camps we do all sorts of uh, all our cooking and all our gear and that kind of thing is in whiz there during the summer after we get out of storage and anyway so I'm gonna grab all the soil put it in there we're gonna put potatoes in there and we're gonna actually actually we're gonna not our potatoes we're gonna put 
sweet potatoes in there, which are like yams. They need really hot weather. And so it's gonna be a nice hot, black hot spot in the sun all day. Um, I was gonna do the sweet potatoes in there because, not today, but uh, because it needs a really hot area and that we can control and water just perfectly and that kind of stuff. So anyway, these are um, uh, oh, beautiful look at that soil that the, um, they'll even push up really good soil into um, oh, gravel, beautiful. you know, area in your, which you don't like obviously in your driveway. But anyway, I'm gonna throw it right in there. 